Welcome back to Mental Health Matters. We are so glad you are with us today. Right before Veterans Day, we're following up with a really great interview with John Miller, who is also going to be talking to us today about the history of PTSD and treatments from a really interesting article he found. Uh, John, tell us about yourself and what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, Scott, thanks a lot for having me on the show. I had, a couple of years ago, asked the Air Force Academy Checkpoints alumni magazine editor to publish an article about post-traumatic stress disorder. As an alumni of the institution, I thought it would be very helpful for grads to read about. Well, it took them two years, but finally this issue, current issue, they came up with the article, War on the Home Front, written by Lieutenant Colonel Retired Stephen Simon, the class of 77. <clears throat> this is so interesting, by the way, that you, that there's this communication back and forth between you guys. And, you know, this is such an interesting insider magazine that you're going to read us some excerpts from because nobody, I mean, I would never even know that a magazine like this would exist, let alone this little organization, which must have lots of people because lots of veterans. Indeed, thousands. And let me just share a couple excerpts. We can talk about this. They, the author, Colonel Simon, goes into a little more depth about the, the history of post-traumatic stress than most previous authors has. First paragraph, he says, although the term PTSD is of relatively re recent vintage, the condition has existed since the dawn of man. It is referenced in one form or another in the Bible hmm. and in writings by the Greek historian Herodotus, Homer in the Iliad, Shakespeare in King Henry IV, Part Two. It was known as nostalgia or homesickness in the 1600s, soldier's heart or irritable heart during the Civil War, shell shock in World War I, mm -hmm. battle fatigue or combat exhaustion in World War II, yeah, I remember those. And yeah. the Korean War. And as stress response syndrome in the Vietnam War. Yeah. 1980, finally, American Psychiatric Association added PTSD to its third edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Or my Bible. Right. It's going to say you. And by the way, you are listening to KRUU FM 100.1 on your FM dial, and you are listening to Mental Health Matters with Dr. Scott Terry and our special guest today, John Miller, who has been a special guest for us before. Uh, and we are talking about PTSD, uh, and the history, and treatments, and in a really interesting article. Indeed, it was. And it points out a couple of experiences of graduates, such as class of 2003, Eva Belanger. I will get into her story just in a minute, but it focuses also on an article, or I should say a book, written by Dr. Charles Hogue, author of Once a Warrior, Always a Warrior, hmm. Navigating the Transition from Combat to Home. He's a retired Army colonel who conducted research at the Walter Reed Army Institute from 2002 to 2009. Mm. He said significantly, you don't stop being a warrior when you come home from combat. I think that's a really interesting point, even to stop there for a second. And, and, and it is fascinating, the different labels that was put on this condition over time, and even how the DSM... Uh, diagnostic Statistic Manual, my Bible, so to speak, um, has changed over time in terms of its classification. I just, I have somebody new uh, I'm seeing with uh, PTSD and wasn't a veteran but has experienced violent trauma. And it's, it's different and yet similar in so many interesting ways. But when we come down to how do you stop being a veteran? How do you stop being who you are 
and transition into a new sense of self. Part of the difficulty all veterans have is when you go from that transition where you're used to that hypervigilance. You're used to, and it's true with uh, police officers or sure. firemen, where yeah. your, your brain is now set to fight or flight. That's and a great, uh, great segue into a point they quote from mm, his book. Tell us. It's like you must have read this, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> the paradox is that everything we labeled a symptom of post-traumatic stress is also a beneficial adaptive function in another context. Absolutely. Specifically combat. Or, or <laughs> in, you know, when we're running around the Sahara or yeah. wherever – and a ti- cyber tooth tiger could eat you at any moment. Right, you right. need to be in that mode, and you need to be able. The the difference is, is can you stop that mode of thinking? Can you stop the fight or flight when you need to? Mm-hmm. When you come back, can you all of a sudden get in your brain that you're not there anymore? That you're in a different context, a- as we say in our world, context is king. Mm, Contents, mm. Context is everything and getting that you're in a different place. Um, and it doesn't really matter if we're talking about being a veteran and then saying, oh, I'm not there anymore. Or the old stereotype for, uh, hyper, uh, for PTSD and hypervigilance was for the Vietnam veteran. They come back and they hear the car backfire and they hit the ground. Yeah. We don't have cars backfiring like that (laughs) anymore. But, you know, it's that same kind of thing. But it's also true for everybody when you're changing transitions. Oh, I'm in a relationship. Oh, I'm not in that relationship anymore. People still get stuck in that. I I give people the example in couples counseling where, you know, they've, they've been, you ever meet somebody who's been divorced 20 years and they're still blaming their ex for everything that's happening in their life today. They're still not there. Or you blame your parents. And yes, your parents could have created lots of stressors in your brain and set you up for all kinds of problems. But your parents aren't living with you today. And you're not the one creating them to have that power over you. Or you are allowing them in your brain to have that power over you. Anyways, um, getting back to this. Sure. So the the... Summarizing what he found in his book about the the treatments available, he says that meditation and mindfulness are emerging now as treatments for post-traumatic stress in addition to the more traditional therapy and medication, not taking the place of them, but supplementing them, working together with them. And he goes on to talk about the the nature of the post-traumatic stress as a physiological disorder mm, so that mm. the woman I mentioned earlier, Belanger, Beautiful has, man. isn't it? Yeah. Has tapped into that. She herself worked after her discharge from the military. And she worked as a combat therapist in a vet center. Mm. But her own PTSD symptoms emerged to the point where she had to give up the position and begin addressing them. After her own treatment, she Because, well, not only is she having her own symptoms, but now she has the secondary trauma, which we've talked about before, which is experiencing somebody else's trauma. So, yes, a veteran comes back, and then the partner of that veteran and the children of that veteran's now are essentially like a disease infected by that, and then they infect other people around them, other family and friends and schoolmates, et cetera. Just like alcoholism. A- absolutely. And then that reverberates like a rock dropped in a small pond, reverberates back to the veteran or whomever who's been having the originating PTSD. Exactly, yeah. So she... she Finally got treatment, and then she she founded what she calls the Warriors Live On Ooh, program. Nice. Warriors Live On. Warriors Live On, which a major component of it is to bring veterans 
out into the natural world and experience healing that way. For example, she says the one of their first programs was taking a group of combat veterans on a four-day, four-night trek on the Pacific Crest Trail. Mm, lovely trail, by yeah, the way. Yeah, for about 40 miles. And she calls this adventure healing. Okay, a little bit different from going to see a therapist and, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. not to discount that, but again, to supplement the experience and to get back into the body. Okay, she uh, also commented that the Air Force Academy fairly recently hosted the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program, which was again an outdoor experience for veterans. That was just this past July. They say several dozens of them visited the academy and did things, for example, like riding horses, tackling the academy's ropes course, fly fishing, Mm -hmm. rock climbing. And what's behind that is building teamwork with each other and rebuilding trust that may have been eroded from their PTSD experience. And that's it's an extra excellent example of using recreational therapy. But one of the th- my theoretical constructs that I've developed for years is something called environmental therapy, where you're using the environment as a tool in the therapeutic process, regardless of if that environment is an office space or if it's your home or wherever it is, how can that environment be utilized? And certainly being in nature, what's interesting about the notion of being in nature itself is it becomes our new reference point. It reminds us uh, logically, chronologically, safety-wise, and in every other way that we are present to this moment, this time, Again, different context. Fight or flight then gets removed unconsciously as well as consciously by our new reference point being outside ourselves in a healthy way. And what, again, to uh, a strained example here, reference points when we're in, all of us are in, ref- in a relationship, our reference point be- often becomes the other. And part of the difficulty um, is that the other then consumes us and we feel lost in the other. And how do we come back to being self-referential? How do we go back and forth between being other-referenced, that reference being outside ourselves, and being self-referenced? And being in nature for veterans especially, or anybody who's been traumatized, really re-regulates the nervous system and re-regulates the brain as well as consciously it reminds you that, yes, you are safe. Yes, you are present to this moment, this time, this space, right? Both time and space are present to now. And the reference point is outside you, but you're able to now inculcate and take in and internalize that reference into yourself so that external natural reference becomes an internalized frame. Thus. And I think that's a good point, and that, of course, ties in with the transcendental meditation being that self-reference tool, which I think I'm really happy to see that these programs are now starting to acknowledge that that's an important key. Well, absolutely. Key it's it's both because, it, you know, it's the same kind of construct in, a, some, in an interesting way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, also the... Because it's a physiological, physiological condition, I'm really happy to see that they are tuning into the importance, like you say, of connecting with nature. I think that one thing that is missing in this article, however, that I've seen not missing in other veterans' nature programs is the component of of service tied in with purpose, mm. purpose, which mm. of course you one of your favorite topics. Yeah, yeah, it is service. <laughs> and I think that the the farming element enables the veteran to be aware of being of service, not only to the 
earth, but to nurturing his fellow human beings through the crops that he or she is raising. So it's, it's really uh, both both <laughs> things. You're both in nature. You are then creating nature, yeah. and then that peaceful. reference becomes who you are. You're I- able to internalize that nature into yourself with a sense of purpose to do something with that nature. And you are creating, obviously, rather than destroying. So you're turning around that, that whole absolutely. combat experience. By the way, you are listening to KRUU FM 100.1 on your FM dial. Uh, you could email us at Scott, well, you could email me directly at Scott at Ardent Center.com. Ardent is A R D E N T C N T E R.com. Scott at Ardent Center.com. Or email us here at K R U U F M. And also, we are archived here. We're also getting our YouTube channel finally together, so that'll soon be on. So please uh, stay in touch with us. And we're talking today about PTSD in veterans, as well as in the rest of us at times, but also the history of war, the history of PTSD, as well as treatment, and coming back to this notion of we were just talking about nature and how we could utilize nature as a powerful source in our life. In in a similar sense where we're we're choosing our tools to make a difference in our lives. And I love how you were just saying, John, about, we're talking, by the way, with John Miller today, uh, one of our lovely guests who's come on frequently, and we're so happy he does. We're, the notion of how we could both use nature as a tool in our lives. We often get lost, like we are talking about our reference point, outside ourselves. We often get lost in the other that other being another person, our job, uh, our boss, our teacher, or this or that. The weather could become the other, something outside. But how do we use that other as a tool to help us self-regulate and become stronger in who we are? Everything can be used as a tool or as a weapon against ourselves or something for ourselves. It's really learning application and how we take control. So using something like nature is so powerful because it gives us that sense of calmness and focus while at the same time allowing us to heal and make a difference in the world, as you say, volunteerism. I can see Eva (coughs) Belanger nodding her head with (laughs) approval. Let me share what she says identically on this Nature has this incredible ability to heal us without me or anyone having to do anything. It's this incredible tool we have that I don't think we utilize enough. So much better said than I did. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry if I pontificate a bit too much, everyone. So uh, the article points out that in 1990, there were 40,000 veterans receiving benefits for post-traumatic stress disorder. How many? 40,000, 1990. Wow. Today, 25 years later, there are more than 800,000. Wait, say those numbers again. 40,000 in 1990, 800,000 today. So it shows you the the huge... uh, Well, now obviously we have better tools of diagnosis. A lot of people that uh, were just passed over years ago are now... Uh, getting the treatment that they needed. But, of course, also we're having so many thousands come back from Iraq, Afghanistan. Absolutely. So. but And also people are letting go of some of the stigma mm-hmm. and yep. being able exactly. to say it's yep. okay to identify because that's one of the, the problems has been such <clears throat> an overwhelming stigma, and especially among veterans, among I think more than any other group, is I – What's that fight or flight? I have to be strong. Have to be strong. And so showing that I've got a condition means showing weakness. Except the truth of the matter is showing that you've got something going on is a sign of strength. Being able to be vulnerable gives you power for any of us. So for any of us who gets lost in like men don't cry kind of thing. Like, no, that's not true. Yeah, in fact, it, uh, are you healthy. sure you didn't read this already? <laughs> 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 here's here's uh, Eva 
Bollinger again. Uh, with a greater understanding of a disease, an increased emphasis on treatment, and a reduction in the stigma factor, uh -huh, uh -huh. the plight of PTSD patients looks to be improving. She sees hope for the future for hers and those of others with post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. <coughs> the author referred to earlier, Dr. Hoag, this is the concluding mm. paragraph to the article, says there is something called post-traumatic stress growth as well. Mm. You also grow from your traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you go through something like that and survive and reach a place of acceptance, you are a very strong person, and you've taken that experience and become a stronger person because of it. I really uh, liked that concluding point. It's not like, oh, everything's it's too bad. We have all these veterans with this condition. He's saying, move out, move from that condition into a a situation of strength. And he's saying you really can utilize. You know, it's it's a point I make to everybody, is that. As I keep saying, application is everything. And we could take something really positive, as I've said a million times, exercise, meditation, diet, sleep, whatever it is, let's say lifestyle issues, and I can make them incredibly destructive depending on how I'm utilizing them. But I could also conversely use trauma as a tool for incredible growth. And there's been a lot written about using our experiences of trauma for great transformation. Mm -hmm. Born again in a non-religious term, in a non-religious frame, um, where you sit there saying, yes, I really can grow from this experience. And that sense of acceptance. I, I want you to read that paragraph again. Sure. Because it is okay. beautiful, beautifully written. And it, because it really is about that point of taking what was to create this new future. So my future focus therapy, which some of you have heard before on this th program, where I talk about creating that future today and allowing what was to never be in denial about it, but to not get lost in, as we've talked about this reference point out there, the other getting lost in what was. I'm now focused on what I'm creating I'm not denying what was, but I'm so busy creating something from that power so I can create a new transformation in my life and in the lives of others. Again, taking both sides of what you're saying, the example of agriculture, um, where you're taking the advantage of not just being in nature, not just creating from that nature, but also having that sense of purpose. And that combination is so powerful to, not, to take and do something with what was, to create something yeah, for what absolutely. will be. Yeah. Say it again. Well said. Dr. Hogue expresses a similar message of hope. There is something called post-traumatic growth as well. You also grow from your traumatic experiences. When you go through something like that and survive and reach a place of acceptance, you are a very strong person and you've taken that experience and become a stronger person because of it. And I love how it's what they're saying and I would add to that it's not just that sense of acceptance. It's that sense of acceptance with action. We don't just accept mm. what was. Good whatever point. what was, but Good we point. do something. There has to be an action step to it. Yep. Internal, external, there has to come back to that sense of purpose to get that you've got choice in your life and that you are able to create something more powerful from what was. We're all damaged. Every single one of us are damaged. Every one of us is going through something every single day. And it's all relative to who we are at this moment. But what brings us strength and power is doing something with that, mm -hmm. regardless of if it's a bad experience that your body's still going through, being a veteran. Even if it was a wonderful experience being a veteran, 
it, your body's still in that fight or flight traumatic reaction. Or if it's just you're lost in a relationship that's not working as productively as you'd like, or your job, or whatever it is, and taking that power into a new direction. So it's not just acknowledging it, but doing something something about about it. it. Good point. So what else would you like to say about this whole thing, John? We've got a couple minutes here. Gee, I thought it was time for a commercial break. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in a couple minutes it will be. I think that that summarizes very well the what I pulled out of the article, and I'm really happy for the chance to be here today and share it. Well, I think <clears> you've <throat> also done this, though, in your life, though. You've, you've relayed in the past about your experience of being in farming as right. well. Transitioning and, from the military. And transitioning, <clears throat> and how you were stuck as well in a position where your brain was still there. Mm-hmm. And certain tools, so the meditation has been very effective for you as well, where you've allowed it to be useful to create transformation. You've allowed your experiences, again, farming for a little while as a way to take nature into yourself and do something with it. Indeed. And experience that wonderful benefit of the, of the peace that comes from nature that's just a part of the natural world mm. i as you say that i recall being out in the my uncle's farm field yeah and one day near sunset and they call it the the sun was setting and the moon was rising the harvest mm. moon mm. Mm. And what a special experience of peace came to me in that moment. I'll never forget it. It was just analogous to the piece of meditation, but it was like a complement to the internal piece or a ah, reflection of it in the yes. external world. And that's that's what we always talk about, 200%, right? Yeah. Right? Internal and external. Right. Yeah. One, one interesting point to think about to finish up here is I'm sure you've had other experiences in your life that things haven't been perfect. Certainly. Um, for instance, uh, you have a lovely wife who I know, and I'm sure though at times you probably disagreed with her on something. Certainly. Um, when things have gotten bad in a non-military context, does your brain, has your brain shifted back to the way that it was during that PTSD kind of experience for you or were you able to once you found more healing to come back to that sunset well I would say both happen to an extent that there is that that what is the word it's a like an automatic reaction almost mm. Mm. The to respond with anger hostility whatever and mm. Then stepping away from that, recognizing that as a thought and feeling and not as who I am in my core. Oh, I love that. And who are you in your core? Yes. Right? Ah. (laughs) And who are all of us in our core? Well, thank you, John, so much. And I say to you all listening, who are you at your core today? right now have a great day everyone see you soon bye good day